I haven't talked about politics very much on this podcast. That's all about to change. This is the Driving with Rob podcast. Welcome to the Driving with Rob podcast. Thank you for downloading. Thank you for listening. I have been doing this podcast now for, it's going on three years. I've been doing it for a little over two years now. And I have pretty much successfully avoided talking about politics for a couple of reasons. One of the reasons is there are a lot of people talking about politics. A lot of people who know more about politics than I do. And I didn't feel like I had anything to add. And another reason is because in the culture we're in right now, talking about politics is a no-win scenario. You can't have an open, honest debate anymore. Because nowadays, people not only disagree with you, they hate you because you disagree with them. So those are the two reasons that I really haven't talked about politics much at all on this podcast. But what I would like to do, or what I would like to start doing, and this is going to be the first in what is hopefully a series of what I call the left hook. If you watch the Sunday morning news programs, Fox News has one, ABC News, I'm not sure what they call it, but it's George Stephanopoulos talking, primarily talking politics on ABC. And then NBC has Meet the Press, ABC, uh, CBS has Face the Nation, And as I have said and will continue to say until something changes, the national news media has become the propaganda arm of the Democratic Party. They just have. And if you disagree with this, then you're probably not going to like anything else I have to say for the rest of this broadcast. If you listen to the Sunday morning news programs, No matter what the story is that they're talking about, there is always some hook that promotes leftist politics. Always. Every time. Every story. No matter what it is. No matter how unbiased and open they try to be. There is always a left hook. Here's why. You have to support the Democrats. Here's why we're right and you're wrong. Here's why it's okay to hate people who disagree with you. I mean, it's, there's always something. There's always a left hook in it. So let's take them one at a time. I actually jotted down just a few notes from watching the Sunday morning shows. So the first one I want to talk about is the ABC News program with George Stephanopoulos. Sometimes I call him Snuffleupticus. And it is meant out of just complete disrespect because Snuffleupticus was the press secretary for Bill Clinton. And now he's a quote-unquote journalist. He believes himself to be anyway. And the reason that I say journalist as derisively as I just said it is because there is no journalistic integrity anymore. They're all pushing the left agenda. But anyway, here's what they talked about. The uh, Stephanopoulos show is called the uh, has a at least a segment. I don't think the whole show is called this. It's called the Powerhouse Roundtable. And it's a bunch of leftist politicians and a bunch of more left-leaning newspaper people, radio people, TV people. Well, on this roundtable, a regular on this roundtable, is Donna Brazil. Donna Brazil was the former, I think she was a former, director of the National Democrat Party. She not only hated Trump... 
She hates all Republicans. Hates them. Doesn't just disagree with them. Hates them. And they asked, or Stephanopoulos asked, Donna Brazil, why has President Biden not made an address or some acknowledgement or some press release after this sweeping gun control bill passed? Because I'm sure Stephanopoulos, just like all Democrats, are grasping at any straw they can to put Biden in a positive light. To show something that Biden actually went for and won. And Biden said that he was really pushing, you know, tougher gun controls. I think they were... um, I don't remember everything that was in it, but it was like one of the things was that they wanted to raise the age to 21 to be able to buy a quote unquote assault weapon or high capacity magazines for these weapons, which I don't disagree with. I think they should. I think you should be 21 because a lot of the shooters, especially the school shooters, are under 21. Their little brains haven't fully developed yet, and they're going after people because they felt bullied at school. So I'm not against this bill, but this was actually a win for the Biden administration. Well, they asked Donna Brazil, why has Biden not made a statement? Why has Biden not come on TV and crowed about this win a little bit? He didn't say it in those terms exactly, but that's what it meant. Donna Brazil said he will address it tomorrow, meaning Monday. And that was her answer for why hasn't Biden addressed this yet? She said, and it's a direct quote from Donna Brazil, he will address it tomorrow. Why is that significant? Well, since the beginning, when Joe first entered the race, Everybody said it's not his decision because for months there was speculation as to whether or not Biden would even run for president. And the rumor was, and the rumor was pretty well squashed by the liberal news media, that Biden didn't want to be president. He didn't want to run for president. Had no ambition to become president at all. But was pressured by leaders in the Democrat Party who felt like Bernie couldn't beat Trump. They were so convinced that Hillary could beat Trump, they just went off and had a big party while Hillary failed to reach out to her constituency. So they all went out and had parties and drank champagne and toasted each other, patted each other on the back because they knew that Hillary was going to be heir to the Obama throne and just assumed it was a done deal. And then when she didn't win, they were all appalled. You remember the video of the woman screaming, no, because Trump won? So in 2020, they took the presidential election a little more seriously. And the rumor was that they pressured Biden into running and appealed to Biden on whatever level it was they appealed to him on, that you owe it to your country. We can't allow Donald Trump to serve a second term. You're the only one in the Democrat Party right now with enough clout and enough name recognition to beat Trump. You have to run. And ever since then, ever since those rumors went around, and ever since Biden himself said he didn't want to run, And then when he finally did, everybody said, well, somebody else is pulling the strings. Well, it's people like Donna Brazil who are pulling the strings. And how do you know? Donna Brazil said, and I quote, he will address it tomorrow. How did she know? She's not part of the administration. She no longer leads the Democrat National Committee, but she said confidently he will address it tomorrow. 
like it's already on the schedule, like we've already written it out for him. All he has to do is read it. That's what I took from that comment. And there was another interesting thing that Donna Brazil said. Or something that she said that piqued my interest. Well, there's two things I want to point out in that statement that she made. She didn't say if. She said when the Republicans take over. Because she knows, even she knows, the yellow dog Democrat that she is, even she knows that the Democrats have no chance of holding on to a majority as long as the Democrats are supporting Joe Biden. As long as Joe Biden is considered to be the leader of the Democrat Party, which whoever's in president is automatically con uh, considered to be the leader of their party, Joe Biden has destroyed the economy. He and his decisions and the decisions made by his advisors. I don't really give Joe Biden a lot of credit for making decisions. I think his advisors are making decisions. Somebody else is pulling the strings. But even Donna Brazil knows that with inflation at the highest rate since Jimmy Carter in the 1970s, with gasoline more than double what it was in 2018, 2019, and an administration that can't get a grip on the supply chain issues, who has basically made a mess of everything he's touched, the Democrats have no chance, and even Donna Brazil admitted it, when the Republicans take over in November. Now, the second part of that statement, she said, they will start a revenge tour. A revenge tour. But this, I guarantee you, is going to become one of the talking points for the Democrats running for office or for those supporting Democrats who are running for office. That when the Republicans get in, they're going to start a revenge tour. How dare you accuse the Republicans of starting a revenge tour when Joe Biden, I think, if I'm not mistaken, broke a presidential record for the most executive orders undone by an incoming president. And I think he actually signed some of them on inauguration day, like that afternoon. And certainly the next day, they immediately started recalling, resending, and undoing executive orders that were made by Trump that the Democrats disagreed with. How dare you accuse the Republicans of revenge? And what did we see for the entire four years of the Trump presidency? A non-stop attack campaign. Not we disagree with you. We want you indicted. We want you impeached. We want you locked up. We want you put in jail. How dare you accuse the Republicans of revenge? When you just spent the last four years, every day of the last four years, trying to get revenge on Donald Trump for beating Hillary. But let's move on. Meet the press with F. Chuck Todd. F. Chuck Todd. In the opening monologue of the Meet the Press program, and, the, and I am just going to say it up front right now out loud, there is no bigger cheerleader for the Democrat Party than Chuck Todd with NBC News. He should turn in his journalism card as well. There is not an unbiased bone in that man's body. Everything he says is anti-conservatism, anti-Republican. Everything he says. I think he actually shed a tear 
when Hillary lost. But anyway, in his opening monologue, it said, in a scroll across the bottom of the screen, a crawl across the bottom of the screen. Nervous Democrats worried about the midterm elections. And F. Chuck himself said, so far, Biden has only succeeded in not being Donald Trump. Even F. Chuck Todd admitted that Biden has had pretty much zero success as president. And there was a statement left, and I can't remember if, if Chuck Todd made it or if one of his roundtable people made it, that Biden was never the first choice of progressives. And for those of you keeping score at home, progressive means far left, extreme left, radical left. Farther left than a communist, that's what a progressive is. Progressives. I don't even like to say progressives. But they admitted, or F. Chuck admitted, that Biden was never the first choice of progressives, the far left. But there again, when they encouraged Joe Biden to run for president in the first place, even though he said he didn't want to, he was the only hope they had because they figured Bernie was too radical, too much of a communist, too much of a socialist to be able to beat Trump. They weren't sure that Bernie could pull the majority of Democrat voters, let alone swing voters. And actually, just as a side note, I actually admired Bernie Sanders because at least Bernie Sanders, love him or hate him, stuck by his guns, said what he meant, said what he believed. What he believes in general is wrong, but at least he wholeheartedly believes it. He doesn't flip-flop on you. Joe Biden, who said for decades that he was against abortion, who said for decades he was against gay marriage. Now all of a sudden he's the champion of abortion rights and gun control and gay rights and transgender rights and all the things that he has said he was against his entire political career in order to get the support of the progressives, the far left, all of a sudden now he has to flip-flop and be in favor of it. Bernie Sanders never stopped being this radical hippie that he was in the 1960s. At least Bernie Sanders is the same Bernie Sanders that he has always been. But the Democrats figured Bernie couldn't beat Trump, but they thought Biden could. But anyway, Joe Biden's response to our progressive agenda is not being addressed. And his response to Roe v. Wade being overturned. And his response to no gun control laws have been passed in the last 30 years. His response to all that was, go vote. Well, guess what, Joe? They did go vote, and they voted for you, thinking that you would help them. And his response now is, well, you know, go vote. If Biden runs for a second term, and nobody really seriously thinks he will, if he runs for a second term, he'll be 86 by the end of his second term. He'll be over 80 by the end of this term. And I have no problem with 80-year-olds. I don't. Vigorous, clear-headed 80-year-olds. You know why you very, very rarely see film footage of Biden walking to the helicopter? Like you used to see Trump walk to the helicopter? Because Biden looks like an old man in a nursing home when he walks. That's why they can't show him. 
because it just points out how old and doddering he really is. Well, on the Meet the Press show, they also interviewed the former governor of Rhode Island on inflation. He is currently the Commerce Secretary of the United States. He said, we've talked ourselves into a recession. Talked ourselves into a recession. Talked ourselves into a recession. He said the economy is strong. No, it's not. A great many people, a great many economists think we're in a recession now. But if you don't get a grip on this 8% inflation rate and this 4 $5 a gallon gasoline, which is, by the way, causing inflation, we will be going into another recession if we're not already in one. He also said, this same guy, Commerce Secretary, says there have been significant reductions in gas prices. You never heard him say there was a significant increase in gas prices. When gas went up 2 to $3 per gallon more than it used to be, but you drop it 10 cents a gallon and it's a significant reduction in price. That's what he called it, a significant reduction in price. Another comment that was made, and I can't remember if it was the Commerce Secretary that made it or if it was someone else on the program, said, it's unfair to say that Biden is not doing enough to help women. What has he done? What has he done? He hasn't done anything. Hasn't done enough. It's not fair to say he hasn't done enough because he's done nothing. So I guess technically the guy has a point. So this is another part of the left hook that I got out of the Sunday shows this week. Just keep denying that it's even happening. Keep denying that the economy is in free fall. Keep denying that the stock market is dropping. Keep denying that gasoline is double or more the price that it should be. Stop denying that you caused it all. Well now, F. Chuck, in his mind, was giving equal time to the Republicans. So he brings in Larry Hogan, the Republican governor of Maryland. Let me tell you about this Republican governor of Maryland. He may be a Republican. He may even be a conservative, but he's an anti-Trumper. That's why he was on the show. That was the hook for the governor of Maryland. Even though he's a Republican, he hates Donald Trump and always has and has always been against him. And he said several times during the interview that he was against Trump from the start. So that was the left hook. In Chuck's mind, having a Republican governor is equal time. No, it's not. Not when the whole Democrat Party is geared toward, let's destroy what's left of Donald Trump's reputation by any means necessary. Like you can't even focus on your Republican adversaries because you've spend, you're spending all your time obsessing over Trump. We have to destroy Trump. We have to make Trump look as bad as possible. This whole January 6th hearing so far, all that has come out of it is he urged this person. He pressured this person. It's a punishment looking for a crime is what it is. So anyway, F. Chuck has this guy who is a Republican in name only. And the reason he's on there is because he's an anti-Trumper. That's the left hook from that guy. And another big part of the left hook, what I like to do when I watch the Sunday shows is to see what they're saying. Because if you watch all these different Sunday shows, you can tell that there was a memo, a communique, an email 
somewhere within the Democrat Party leadership that says, this is what we're going to talk about and this is how we're going to phrase it and we all need to be on the same page. Like, for example, a couple of months ago, when even the Democrats started talking about how gas prices should not be this high. The talking point then was, the president doesn't control gas prices. You heard it on Face the Nation. You heard it on Stephanopoulos. You heard it on Meet the Press. All the major news outlets, all the Democrats, no matter which Democrat they talked to, were all saying the same thing. The president doesn't control gas prices. But mark my words, with gas coming down a few cents a gallon, watch him take credit for it. He'll take credit for the reduction in gas price and claim no responsibility for the increase in gas prices, which he is pretty much, and his administration is pretty much solely responsible for. It. But that's the left hook. What are the Democrats going to talk about this week? Because they all try to get on the same page, and they really are throwing spaghetti against the wall to see what sticks. And whatever sticks, that's the line they're going to go with. Well, this week's line is going to be in reference to these ridiculous series of hearings that are going on about trying to convict Donald Trump of something, of anything. The talking points from the Democrats are going to be Trump was trying to hold on to power and was convinced that there was a voter fraud. Well, of course there was voter fraud. That's not even a question. Of course there was voter fraud. I have talked to people within my own county who were responsible for going over the ballots and verifying the ballots. A county commissioner friend of mine got a phone call from a lady who said, I got eight absentee ballots in the mail. What should I do with the other seven? And that was just one person. How many other people got eight ballots, filled them all out and sent them in? Many, many instances of people who were deceased receiving absentee ballots in the mail. Well, you don't put your name on it when you send it in. You just send it in. So if a family of three or four got 10 ballots and filled them all out, that's voter fraud. And that was just in the county I live in. There are 88,000 voters in the county I live in. There are eight million people in New York City. Just in the county I live in, they were estimating that 1% of all the ballots were fraudulent. 1%. Within the margin of error. That means 99% of them were valid. 99% were good. That's a pretty good track record. If you can claim a 99% success in any endeavor, that's pretty good. But see, I live in a very, very small county. If 1% of ours was fraudulent, that's almost 1,000 votes. But there are only around 90,000 people who live in the county I live in. 90,000. So 1% is only 900 votes. Well, 900 votes could potentially sway an election in a very, very close race. 900 could sway the election. There are 8 million people in New York City alone. 8 million. What if 99% of the ballots in New York City were not fraudulent, but 1% was, that's 80,000 votes, 80,000 votes just for New York City. Well, what if you have 1% fraud and they were all fraudulent toward the Democrats, which most major cities are? 
That's New York, Chicago, Los Angeles. That's a lot of votes. Of course there was fraud. And if you will recall, Trump said the way they're going to cast fraudulent ballots is they're going to use COVID as an excuse. They're going to allow more people than ever in history to do absentee ballot. Because you can't verify them. If you send eight ballots to the same person and he votes Democrat on all eight and mails men, how do you know? Of course, that's how they're going to do it. Of course, that's how they're going to do it. He said it back then. But this is going to be the talking point in the coming week. Trump trying to hold on to power. That's going to be the narrative this week. All right, last but not least, let's go to Face the Nation. By the time I got to Face the Nation, I was worn out. I was worn out. Like I'm sure you are by now listening to this podcast. But Face the Nation... Pretty much the entire hour of Face the Nation was about the January 6th hearings. And do you think once in the broadcast, they pointed out the fact that so far zero evidence has come out to convict Donald Trump of a crime? No. Never mentioned, not even once, that zero evidence has been presented that made Trump guilty of a crime. They interviewed this guy, and this was supposed to be the big turning point, the nail in the coffin. They interviewed this guy named Scipione. I'm pretty sure that was his name, Scipione. And they said this would be the most damaging and telling testimony of the entire hearing. They interviewed this guy for eight hours. Have you ever been interviewed for eight hours? Eight hours. They were accusing Scipione of a crime, but they interrogated this man for eight hours. I mean, this is, this is what you do to war criminals. You interrogate them for eight hours. You, you keep hammering them and hammering them and hammering them until you get them to crack, until you get them to admit to anything, just so it'll stop. They interviewed Scipione for eight hours. And while we're talking about these January 6th hearings that are going on, this is another left hook that you're going to hear. The new phrase that all the Democrats are using is the capital assault. The capital assault. And I've even heard at least one recently refer to it as the deadly capital assault. Remember, only one person died on January 6th. It was a Trump supporter who was shot in the face by a Capitol Police officer. And it was a woman. You never hear that part on the news. But go look it up. Even the New York Times, as liberal a newspaper as has ever existed, did a whole write-up on it. They said, yeah. I mean, of course, they didn't do the write-up until April. But they did a whole write-up on the deadly capital assault. One person, a woman, was shot in the face by a Capitol Police officer and killed. The other deaths, one was a heart attack, one was a drug overdose. I think one of the Capitol Police officers had a stroke the next day because of all the stress. But only one person was actually killed by these radical militants who were carrying guns. They were all carrying guns, and the only person who was shot was shot by a Capitol Police officer? Tell me again how your news media is not biased. But that's the new buzz phrase. That's the new buzzword that they're using is capital assault. And again... As I said earlier in the podcast, it's a punishment looking for a crime. 
because the only thing that has come out so far is that Trump urged this person, Trump pressured this person, but he didn't actually do anything. He didn't actually order anything. And even if he did, the people didn't carry it out. So where's the crime? But to sum it all up, the two things you're going to hear all week, all week long this week, from the Democrats and the Democrat media, is that the economy is strong. And that gas prices are dropping. The economy is still failing. Gas prices went up $2, $2.5, $3 per gallon. They came down 15 cents. And the original talking point was the president can't control gas prices. He didn't take any of the blame for them going up, but you watch him take the credit for them coming down. And the only honest debate you're going to hear on any of the news programs, do you think there will be a Trump-Biden rematch? I hope not. This is my personal opinion. I hope Trump doesn't run. I really do. I hope he doesn't run. Because the only thing the Democrats have to run against Republicans on is we're not Donald Trump. That was the only thing they had in 2020. And with the economy in the toilet like it is now, that's still all they have. And more and more Democrats every day are saying they don't want Biden to run in 2024. And that will be the only honest debate you hear. In your opinion, what do you think? Will there be a Trump and Biden rematch? I hope not. I hope neither one of them runs in 2024. The Democrats have nobody. Because as much disappointment as there has been in Joe Biden, Democrats like Kamala Harris even less. Kamala Harris was one of the lowest vote getters during the Democrat primary. Nobody liked her. So they know they can't run her. They know they can't run Joe because he will be in his 80s if he runs in 24. He will already be in his 80s. If he completed two terms, he'd be 86 by the end of his second term. And the Democrats have nobody waiting in the wings to run. Nobody likes Hillary, and now Hillary is another 16 years older. Nobody liked her to begin with. So you can't run Hillary. You can't run Kamala. What do you got left? Buttigieg? The Republicans are not much better, but at least the Republicans have a couple of candidates. I keep hearing DeSantis come up a lot in discussions. But really, the Republicans don't have a strong, strong candidate yet. So it will be interesting to watch to see how it all turns out. But watch for these words this week. The economy is strong and gas prices are coming down. That's the left hook this week. And that's going to do it for this episode of the podcast. I told you it was going to get political. I can't help it. These people are driving me crazy. But thanks for listening. Thanks for downloading. If you like the podcast, recommend it to other people. Share it on social media. Because if you like it, chances are your friends will like it too. All right? Thanks again. I'll talk to you next time. Bye now.